All right, so today we're going to uh, finish up chapter two, okay, which is um, section 2.5. Um, 2.6 we skip. Okay, so technically that's the last section, but we're not going to do 2.6. Uh, so 2.5 will be the end of chapter two, uh, and then we'll take a look at 3.1. Okay, so just a reminder of um, the projectile motion equation. Okay, we already have this in our notes from uh, another section we talked about it. But this formula gives you the height of an object in feet, okay, based on um, an initial velocity and an initial height. Okay, so everything in this problem assumes you're working in feet, and the time unit has to be in seconds. Any, um, any questions on that with formula? So the kind of problem we did before is maybe we found when an object was exactly 20 <coughs> feet off the ground. Okay, what we're going to do now is maybe see when an object is at least 20 feet off the ground. So greater than or equal to 20 feet. Okay, so we're basically going to look at it as, a, as an inequality. All right, so for this problem, it says a, a ball is thrown straight up with an initial velocity of 80 feet per second. And it's thrown from ground level. Okay, so that, that tells us something about the initial height. When is the ball at least 64 feet above the ground? Okay, so the two things we have to fill in for are V sub 0 and S sub 0. What's What's V sub zero in, uh, in this problem? Leo? E. Yep. And how about S, <coughs> S sub zero? Uh, zero. Zero, because it's from ground level. Okay. So our height as a function of time. And now I'm not going to put an equal sign because I want to know when my height is. What do they want to know again? So I want to think of it this way, when the height is what? Yeah. Greater than 64 feet. Um, or, or equal to, right? Because they technically they say at least. So that would that would include. So that's what you want to know when your height is greater than or equal to 64 feet. So that's our height. That's the formula for height, S of t. And I want to know when my height is greater than or equal to. Um, and actually, you know what? Instead of putting that, I can fill in. Um, yeah, that's the way we, we want to do it. Um, because, wait a minute. No, I think I had it right on the other side. It like this. Our formula for, you know, let's, let's just set it up first and then we'll worry about the inequality. Okay, what comes first to that formula? About 16t squared. Uh, no, careful, negative 16. Oh. So, negative 16t squared. Plus, uh, Shauna, what's going to be the next thing? V. Yep, and what's my V sub zero? Six. Six? Zero. My initial velocity, um, 80. Uh, so my initial velocity is 80 feet per second. Plus, uh, Gracie, what's the last thing? Yeah, plus zero, and I don't really even need it because it's just plus zero. Okay, so that's a formula that tells me my height. <coughs> and I want to know when that height is greater than or equal to 64. Okay, that's, that's what I want to figure out. Okay, so any questions on that? 
Right. So the approach it said to use was a graphing calculator. So what I'm going to do is graph what's on the left in Y1. I'm going to put what's on the right in Y2. And I'm going to get a parabola, and it's going to cross a horizontal line at some point. Um, for my y max, I'm going to I'm going to set it up around like I'm going to try 80 feet. If the ball goes above 80 feet, that's not going to be high enough, but hopefully that'll be good. Um, what's the lowest the ball can go? Zero. What's the lowest value you could plug in for time? Zero. Um, the maximum value is how long it stays in the air for. Um, we don't know how long it's in the air for. So let's, let's assume it's in the air less than six seconds. If it's not, it's going to go off the screen. So there's the object, the ID, the high enough. But actually, if I'm not looking for a complete graph, I don't need to see the top of that. Unless I want to know how high it's going to go. But if I want to know when it's above 64 feet, it crosses the 64 foot mark at that time on the way up, and it crosses again at that time on the way down. So what would I have to do twice to get those two time values? Trevor? I'll use the intersect. Thing. Perfect, yep. We're going to do an intersect. Okay, I'll. Um, I'll do the one on the right. If someone else could uh, could do the one on the left, that would be helpful. So pick a point on the blue, the red. My guess is where I want it. So on the way back down, it's going to cross 64 feet at four seconds. So the time has to be between <coughs> something in four seconds. Um, does anybody have the other intersection? Yep. One. One. Okay. So as long as you pick a time between one and four seconds, the object will be above 64 feet. Before one second, it's going to be below it. After four seconds, below it. Okay. Any questions on that? How long does the ball stay in the air? Well, we could look at the graph and just calculate the root. And, and we can see where it hits the ground. But if you want to know how long the ball is, is in the air for, you basically want to know when, when the height of the ball is what. Think about if you wanted to find this this point, because that's when the ball is going to come back on the ground. So what, what would be the height at that point? The height would be zero. Zero. The height's going to be zero at two spots. We already know the height is zero here. But the height is going to be zero again here. So think about solving a quadratic. You get two answers. <coughs> and it's the second answer that we want. That will tell us when the object is back on the ground again. And that's exactly how long it's in the air for. So let's take our quadratic, uh, negative 16 t squared plus, was the initial velocity 80? 80. And you basically want to know when the height, you can think of it two ways, when the height is greater than 0. Because as long as it's greater than zero, it's still in the air. Once, it's, once it equals zero, technically it's not in the air anymore. It's, it's back on the ground. Okay. So let's solve that. Right? Um, so what we could do is we could factor it. Right. So let's factor. <coughs> um, first thing, let's factor out a 16. We can because we can make everything smaller. In fact, we can even factor out a negative sixteen. How many times does negative? Uh, what's eighty divided by negative sixteen? Yeah, and you know what? I'm even going to factor out 
more. I'm going to factor out the negative, the 16, and the t. So I'm going to get t. And how many times did it go in? Negative 5. OK, so now let's, let's look at that. We're trying to figure out when this <coughs> times this is greater than 0. Let's start with t. What kind of values are you always going to have for t? t is always what kind of number? Positive. t is always a positive number. Okay. So if you plug in, let's start with the first step. If you plug in a positive number right there, what's a positive number times a negative? negative. So this is always going to come out negative. Always because it's going to be a negative 16 times a positive number. But now, if you, want, <coughs> if you want this times that to be greater than 0, then what, what would this have to come out to? T minus 5 would also have to be a negative, because that's the only way you're going to get a greater than 0. So now, the question is really, when is T minus 5 negative? That's, that's the answer to this problem. So when is t minus 5 less than 0? How would you solve that, Jane? Okay. 5, so you get t less than 5. So the answer to the question, how long does the ball stay in the air? I think the book says 5 seconds. Technically, it's like 4.999999 seconds, because at 5 seconds, the ball is back on the ground. So I guess it depends on how you worded it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't word it that tricky on a test. Uh, five, five seconds is OK to say. <coughs> it's, back on, it's back on the ground at five seconds. Okay. Any questions on that? So that's solving um, just using factoring. Um, when is the ball at least 64 feet off the ground? That's what we just did graphically. Um, I'm going to hold off on, on doing that right now because what I show you in the next part is going to help you to do that. Okay, so we're not, we're not going to go through that algebraically right now. Okay, so let's look at how you would do that algebraically. Okay, you would use what's called a um, sign pattern. And the idea is that if you have a linear factor, let's make up two of them. That's a linear factor. There's nothing squared about the x, it's just x plus 2. Here's another linear factor. Each linear factor is equal to 0 at exactly one value. What value for x would make this first factor 0? Negative. negative 2. So negative 2 is the dividing line between positive and negative. If you give me a number smaller than negative 2 and plug it into that first parenthesis, what kind of number would you get? You would get a negative. If you plug in exactly negative 2, you get 0. What if you plug in a number bigger than negative 2? You get a positive. Okay, and we could do the same thing here. What value would make that factor exactly 0? Yeah. Three. 3. What if you plug in a number smaller than 3, like 2? What do you get? Oh, crazy. Yeah, you get a negative. Um, how about Leo if you plug in a number bigger than 3? You get positive. You get positive. So now, if you asked me, um, how about the number 1? What would you get in this whole thing if you plug in a 1? Well, I would first look at this chart. Where does 1 fall in the chart on the left? Negative or positive? Positive. 
it falls in the positive, somewhere right there. Where does one fall in the chart on the right, negative or positive? It falls in the negative. And then I'd say, okay, if you're plugging in a number one, it's going to be a positive times a negative, which is a, a negative. All right? So that's the idea of what we're going to do. You make, you make a chart like that for each, <coughs> each factor, and then you kind of look at what happens when you combine it together. It's, I kind of just went through this with you. I'm not going to do this again. But here's another linear factor. If you plug in one, you would get zero. The one below it, you plug in negative four and you get zero. Okay, so the idea is you draw a number line, you mark the zero, okay, like I did with negative two and three. And then you determine the sign in each section of the number line. Okay, one side is usually negative, the other side is usually positive. And page 113 draws some more diagrams of this, but I, I think the diagram I showed you is pretty much the same thing. Okay, so let's see if we can um, use this to solve, solve a problem. Okay, don't worry about the last step yet. The last step is once you have <coughs> A number line for each individual um, factor, then you're going to combine it, you're going to combine these two together into one number line. Okay, and I'll show you how, you how you do that. All right, so the first thing is you've got to make sure, just like when you saw the quadratic, that it's always what number by itself on one side? Zero. Zero. Yep, always got to make sure you have zero by itself. Is, is this one already set up to do that? Yeah, we're good. So the, to use the sign pattern, it relies on factoring. If you can't factor, you can't use this method. Okay, so let's see if we can factor that. It has to be 2x and x. Um, what about my signs? One's positive, one's negative. Um, that would be my advice. And two numbers that multiply to give me five, well, five is prime, so there's only one way to do it. Um, Tessa, well, what do you multiply together to get five? Five and one. Five and one? And where do you want to put the five? With the one with the order uh, In the, the second parenthesis? Yeah, that's a good, good spot. So we have factored it um, correctly. Okay, now let's mark the zero or the root for two x minus one. What would you plug in for x to make that zero? Yep, one half. One half. What happens if you plug in a number smaller than a half, like zero? What kind of number do you get? Negative. What if you plug in a number bigger than a half, like uh, 10? What kind of number would you get? What? Positive. Yep. Okay, so that's our first one. Now we're going to make a number line for the x plus 5. Rebecca, what would you plug in for x to make that zero? Negative five. And Tanya, if you plug in a number smaller than negative five, like negative 10, what kind of number would you get? Negative. negative. What about if you plug in a number bigger than negative five, <coughs> like zero? You get a positive. Now what we're going to do is we're going to combine that all together into one number line. Okay, so I'm going to mark both roots on the same number line. And basically what it does is it divides it into three sections. 
So let's look at what happens if we multiply 2x minus 1 times x plus 5, and we pick a number smaller than negative 5 in both. Right, so uh, doing that, what, um, what would you, if you plug in a number smaller than negative 5 into 2x minus 1, what region does that fall in? That falls into the negative. So we have a negative. <coughs> Now let's look at the other one. Sean, if I plug in a number smaller than negative 5 into this one, what kind of number do I get? Negative. Another negative. So in this region, if you plug in a number smaller than negative 5, it's going to be a negative times a negative, which is positive. a positive. Okay. Now let's look at between negative 5 and a half. If you want, you can pick a number. Uh, Zero. Okay, if you want to do something like concrete. But Dylan, if you pick a number between negative 5 and a half in the 2x minus 1, where would that fall? Um, negative. Yep, that would be in the negative. And Gracie, if you pick a number between negative 5 and a half in x plus 5, where would that fall? Negative. Positive. Positive. Okay. Negative five and a half would be somewhere, be like somewhere over there. Okay, so that would fall in positive. And now you're going to multiply the result together. So Sam, what's um, a negative times a positive? Negative. It's a negative. Now let's look if we pick a number bigger than a half in both. So Jane, if I'm bigger than a half in the first one, what kind of number do I get? Positive. Bigger than a half in the second one? Positive. Another positive. Positive times positive? Positive. Okay, so that's the tool we're going to use to answer the question. Okay, now the answer is easy. We just have to go up and look at what they asked. Where are we greater than zero? That means where is that positive? Well, that is positive in two regions. Here and here. Those are the answers. So how would you, how would you write this first interval? Did it say we could equal? No, we have to be strictly greater than. Okay. So we have to just be positive. So in this case, we're still going to use a parenthesis on that. And so that covers that section. And then what would I put next? Yep, two and a half. parentheses up to positive. And I need one more thing. means I can pick any number from negative infinity to negative 5 or from 1 half to infinity. Now if they flipped it around and they said where is this negative, you would just say between negative, a half and negative 5 and a half. So that's the idea of how you use a sign of a sign pattern chart. <coughs> hey, any questions on it? Alright, so I've got a couple of them. Try this one. Okay, this one I've already factored for you. Okay, so Trevor, looking at the first factor, what number would you have to plug in there to make that zero? Zero. Zero. Now, what if you plugged in a number smaller than zero? Negative. Negative. Bigger than zero? Positive. Perfect. Let's look at the next one. X plus 3. Tessa, what number would you have to plug in to make x plus 3 uh, 0? Negative. Plug in negative 3. What if you plug in a number smaller than negative 3? <coughs> Bigger than negative 3? Good. And Rebecca, um, how about x minus 1? Positive 1. Again, these number lines aren't all to scale, so don't compare one to the other where I'm placing things. Just, I'm just making number lines. Um, what if you plug in something smaller than one? 
and bigger than one? Positive. Now, when I put all these on the same number line, how many sections am I going to have? Four. Okay, we're going to have, start with the smallest number, negative three, zero, one. Again, not, not to scale. Okay, and we're multiplying everything together. Okay, so let's check smaller than negative three in all of them. Time if I'm smaller than negative three in the first one, where would that be? Negative. Sean, if I'm smaller than negative three in the second one? Negative. And Dylan, if I'm smaller than negative three in the third one? Negative. That's also negative. And you're going to multiply a negative times a negative <coughs> times a negative, which Gracie would be? Negative. Now what usually happens is it just alternates negative, positive, negative, positive. But we can check one more region if, if you want, just to be sure. Um, Sam, so between negative 3 and 0 in the first factor. Negative. Yep, that's a negative. Um, Jay, between negative 3 and 0 in the second factor. Positive. Now we're in positive. And negative between negative three and zero in the third factor. Negative. And we know what's a negative times positive times negative. Positive. That's a positive. Does anybody need me to go through the other two sections? So it's just going to alternate. That's how it always works. And now we go back up, and they wanted greater than or equal to zero. So we have to keep that in mind. That's fine. You could you could do it like we just did. Yep. So greater than or equal to zero. How many regions satisfy that condition? Oh yeah. Two. Two. <coughs> greater than or equal to zero is here and here. How would we write the first region? About um, yeah. Um, can we equal zero on this one? We can't bracket. So we put a bracket. And then zero. Up to zero. Can we, again, can we equal zero? Yes. Yep. So negative three to zero. Or, um, Trevor, can you give me my um, interval that's all the way on the right? Right? Because you can go as high as, as you want. And that's, that's your answer. Any question on that? Now, I don't think we need to go through it, but a division would work the same way. Um, with division, the only difference is instead of doing like negative times negative, it's negative divided by negative. But it's the same rules. Right? Negative over negative would be positive, um, things like that. Okay. The only thing you want to be careful about, maybe, maybe we should go through this a little bit. So that would be 4. Negative positive, that would be negative 5 halves. Negative positive. And then we have negative 5 halves and 4. All right, so if I'm, let's see, if I'm smaller than negative 2.5, I'm going to be negative divided by negative, which would be a positive. Let's just check one more. Between negative 2.5 and, and 4, negative, positive. What's a negative divided by positive? Negative. Right. So now they said less than or equal to zero. That happens right there. 
How would you write an interval where you are less than or equal to zero? But you need to be careful when you write it. Any thoughts on how you'd write what we circled? Well, um, Rebecca? Uh, it's a good, well, we already circled the region, so we want it to be um, less than or equal to zero, so we have to be in the negative section. So how would we write that after that? Okay. No, it's up to four. Yep. Yep. So that's that's good. The numbers are good. Yep. Can't now be negative five times because it would be zero on the bottom. But it's okay. I said I could equal zero. Oh. Yeah. I tricked you out of saying what you were saying. You were right. It can equal zero, but the problem is you can't you can't use that value because you're doing division. If you use negative five halves. It's okay in just that by itself, but it's not okay when you put that in the bottom of a fraction because now it would be a divide by zero. So even though the inequality says you can equal, the fraction says no, you can't. You can't divide by zero. So you got to be careful with that one. Okay. Any question on that one? Right. Let's... Um, Let's try one on a calculator. So if you can't factor it, we're going to graph. All right, and there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, one way to do it is to move everything to one side, like we did yesterday, or leave it the way it is. This one I'm just going to leave the way it is. And I'm going to type in x cubed minus 2x squared minus 5x plus 7. And I'm going to put 2x plus 1. <coughs> so I'm looking for where the cubic is greater than or equal to 2x plus 1. So I'm looking for where the graph in blue is above or equal to the graph in red. And if you didn't adjust your window, you should probably do uh, zoom six. Okay, so there's the graph in blue. And I want to know where that is above or equal to the graph in red. Take a look at that. Right. How many spots is the graph in blue? <coughs> how many, how many uh, intervals is the graph in blue above the graph in red? Yeah? Um, Where were you thinking three? We'll call, you know what? Let's call these intersection points A, B, and C. So where do you think the graph in blue is above the one in red? A and B. Between A and B, yeah. So that's that's one. Okay. So that's just between A and B and then C. 
And what about C? Um, can anybody be more specific with C? Yeah, greater than C, or equal in this case. So what I just highlighted in green, those are the two sections. Um, does anybody need me to go over how to find the intersects again? So let's just call them A, B, and C. You would actually have to calculate them out. And now, how would I write the interval between A and B, including A and B? Um, Sean? Bracket A. So that's exactly what you would write. You would just have to find what A, B, and C are. That's how you do it on a graphic calculator. Okay. Any questions on? If they wanted to know where the blue graph was below, I would say less than or equal to A and between B and C. It would be just the opposite. Okay, so that, um, that's all that's really in 2.5, just practicing on the sign chart. And then once you can't, use your calculator. All right, so in chapter three, um, we focus on polynomials. Okay, polynomials are graphs that have certain characteristics. Okay, polynomials are generally pretty nice graphs to draw. And we'll learn a few of the few of the features. Okay, so that, in general, is, is what a polynomial looks like. You usually start with your x to the highest power, maybe like you know x cubed, and then the next term is one lower, your x squared, and then you get down to your x, and then you finish with your constant. And sometimes <coughs> there's there's numbers in front of those, like. 3x cubed plus 2x squared. So that a sub n, that just represents a um, coefficient. And you don't always have to have every single term from the highest exponent to the lowest. You might have 10x to the 12th plus 3x squared plus 2x, and that's it. Okay, you might not always have every single exponent from high to low. But generally, that's how you list it. Okay, that's called descending order. So this says two things. First of all, it says n has to be a non-negative integer. You can, in a polynomial, the exponent always has to be a number. It can't be a fraction or decimal. And it can't be negative. It has to be a non-negative integer. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay, things like that. Um, if it was 0, we wouldn't even write the term down because anything to the 0 power is what? It's 1. So it would just be 1 times something. That, that's kind of what your constant is. That's why there's no variable with it. So that, that would be your constant. And then it says here, this symbol means for all. So it means for any value of n that you pick, a sub n, okay, which is the number in front of x, has to be a real number. So in other words, the numbers that you put in front of x in either a sub 1, or a sub 2, a sub 3, doesn't matter. Whatever coefficient you pick, it has to be a real number. Okay, so no, no imaginary. And other than that, those are the two conditions for something to be a polynomial. Um, the degree of the polynomial, simplest way to think of it, it's the highest exponent. As long as the coefficient of that exponent isn't a zero. Okay, what if I did something like this? What would be the degree of that polynomial? Sam? Um, 
Um, nope, it wouldn't be three. Yeah? It'd be two. This doesn't even exist, right? Because if you do x cubed times zero, it's, it's just gone. <coughs> so really, the highest exponent there that doesn't have a coefficient of zero was a two. In fact, we wouldn't even normally write something like that. We would just write it like that. Okay. So any, uh, any questions on that? So you just have to be careful. What if we, um, what if we had something like this? 3x cubed plus 2x squared plus 5x to the fourth. What would be the degree <coughs> of that one? Yeah? It would be 4. Usually you would like to put the highest degree term first, but it doesn't always have to be first. Okay, so you need to look through the whole thing and, and check. So a couple special ones. Uh, degree 1 is linear. Degree 2 is quadratic. 3 is a cubic. Um, beyond that, we just say it's a polynomial of degree whatever. 4, 5, 6. Okay, no, no special names. Uh, the domain of a polynomial. It's all real numbers. Because all you're doing with the number is maybe you're squaring it, maybe you're cubing it, maybe you're multiplying it by 3. You can do that to any number you want. There's no square roots <coughs> in a polynomial. And there is no division of variables. So you're never going to divide by 0. So the two things that you have to be careful with never happen in polynomials. So the domain is all real numbers, always. The range depends. Okay? Generally, even degree polynomials and odd degree polynomials have different behavior. Think of an even parabola. Is the range all real numbers in a parabola? Is the range all real numbers in a parabola? No, because parabolas don't go up forever and down forever. They only go one direction. Okay? So even degree polynomials, generally the range either has a minimum and it goes up, or a maximum and it goes down. Odd degree polynomials are a little different. Odd degree polynomials always have that shape to them. And again, these continue. I just didn't draw all the arrows. But they continue forever up and down. This specifically is a cubic. Okay, that's the formula for a cubic. So what would the range be for a cubic polynomial? Crazy? Would it be negative infinity and to and then yeah, negative infinity to infinity. Yeah. All, in fact, all odd degree polynomials <coughs> go up and down forever. Even ones don't. The 3 tells you how many times it could cross the x-axis at most. Um, or another way to think of it is the graph can take that number minus 1 turns. Okay. So this is going up. It took 1 turn. Two turns. Okay, so that highest exponent, if you subtract one from it, that's how many times the graph could turn. It doesn't have to, but it could. That's why um, x squared, if you subtract one from it, you get a one, and parabolas can make one turn. Okay, there's your formula for a fourth degree polynomial. How many times could a fourth degree polynomial Cross the x axis. How many? Three times. Uh, no, the one above can cross three times. Oh, four times. Four times. How many turns can a fourth degree polynomial take? Three. That's three, yes. So a fourth degree polynomial could look something like that. It doesn't have to. 
okay? But it will either have a minimum and go up forever, or it will have a maximum and go down forever. Sometimes, if you just graph like y equals x to the fourth, it kind of looks like a parabola, but it's a little more flat <coughs> on the bottom. So that's, that is a fourth degree. It's the simplest, simplest one you could have. So I said a fourth degree polynomial could cross the x-axis up to four times. Could it cross three times? What do you think, Jay? Yeah. Let me just make that a little longer. There's crossing four times. There's three times. Could it cross two times? Two times? How about um, one time? Yeah, one time. How about zero times? Okay. Yeah, zero. So it could cross a bunch of different times. So let's look at this fourth degree. Um, what's the domain of that? Again? All real numbers, you shouldn't even think about it. Polynomial, there's no division, there's no square roots. You can take any number you want, raise it to any power you want that's um, appropriate for a polynomial. So you're just talking about powers that are zero and up. So domain, always, h. Is this type of polynomial going to go up and down forever? What do you think, Abby? No, it's an even. Evens don't go up and down forever. So the range is not all wheels. The range, you type it in. X to the fourth <coughs> plus five x cubed plus two x squared minus eight x plus one. Okay, let's do zoom six. Might have to adjust it. I don't. I don't know yet. Okay. Do we do we need to adjust it from the standard window? Megan, what do you think? No. No? Can you see all the values in the range on that window? I mean, well, you'll never see all of them because it goes to infinity, but can you see the lowest value? No. It goes off the screen a little bit, I think. You know what I mean? It goes off. So if you want to find that lowest value, it will not work to find the minimum right now because it goes off the screen. So you need to set your y. Um, Gracie, what would I need to set a little lower? Um, I don't think we need to see further to the left. Oh, your y. We need to see further yeah. down. So why not? Okay, let's try, um, I'm just going to try negative 16. And now, looking at that graph, we should be able to see that it has a minimum. And it's going to go up forever from that minimum. So from this point on, if you put a horizontal line, it would hit anywhere you want to put it. Okay. So we have to find that minimum. So second calc minimum. Okay, pull over to it. Make sure you go to the left, okay, then go back to the right. And the guess doesn't really matter. So what, what's the, the minimum value that that will hit in the range? Rebecca? Careful, that's domain.
Yes, yeah? Negative 12. Yeah, if you round it off, it's about negative 12. We'll just round to two decimal places. But yep, yeah, that's the number you want to be looking at. So any number from negative 11.95, including it, because we do hit it, shows we hit it, and up, that's your range. So negative 11.95 up to infinity. There's your range. Domain, it's going to keep going left to right forever. Even though it doesn't look like it's going left and right very much, it still is very, very slowly going to go left and right forever. All right, so fifth degree polynomials, you can look at those on page 143. Uh, but just very quickly, how many times could a fifth degree cross the x-axis? Up to, up to five. It's guaranteed to cross at a minimum how many times? It has to cross once because it's an odd degree polynomial. Odds go up forever and down forever, <coughs> and they're connected. So if you go up forever and down forever, you've got to go through zero somewhere, at least once. Um, how many turns can a fifth degree polynomial take? Up to four. It doesn't have to take all four, but it could take up to four. So it could look something like one, two, three, four, if it took every single turn. The turns could be more or less, you know, they could be flipped over, things like that. But all these turns I'm showing you create what we call local maxes and local minimums. Local just means that it's a point that's higher or lower than everything around it. It doesn't mean it's the highest or the lowest point ever. It just means that it's higher or lower than everything else around it. Right? So, for example, here is a local max. Am I saying that's the highest value that the graph ever reaches? No. It goes up forever. But that point that I circled is higher than everything else around it. Okay. And this is a local min. It's not the lowest point we ever reach, but it is lower than anything else around it. Any questions on the idea of what a a local max or a local minimum is? Just a point that's higher or lower than anything around it. If you wanted to shorten it, that's, that's how you could say it. And together, when you look at all the local max and the local mins of a, of a graph, those are called the local extrema. So if you see a question on a test or in the homework that says find the local extrema, They need to find the local mins and maxes. Now, if you had something like a parabola, this value at the bottom right there, that point, the vertex, that's called a global minimum. That point right there is the lowest point the parabola ever hits. Nothing ever goes any lower than that. Okay, so you call that a global minimum. Or you could call this point right there, that's a global maximum. That is the highest point ever. It never goes any higher. Okay, not sure if the book uses the term global, but global, that's, that's what it means. Would odd degree polynomials have global maxes and mins? Trevor, what do you think? No, because no, they go up and down forever. So odd degree polynomials would not have global anything. Okay. Any, any questions on that? Hmm? Is there like a special way to write it? Like if it asks? If they ask for a local max or min? Yeah, I'll show you how we, we do it right now. So there's two questions. I can ask you what is the minimum? And then I could ask you, what value of x do you plug in to get that? Okay, two, two separate questions. This one is asking both. So I'm going to graph. x cubed 
minus 4x. I'm going to do zoom 6. The first thing I will do is find the minimum. And then we'll write where it occurs. So second calc, minimum. Get, pick a point to the left. Pick a point to the right. Do your guess. And there's the information you need. So my first question is, what is the local minimum? What value does our graph hit as a minimum in that region? Yeah? Yeah, so we're going to say negative 3.08. That is the minimum. Minimum is, I should say local min, is negative 3.08. And when does it occur? When x is what number? Leo? When x is negative 1.5. Um, for the min? Yeah. You sure it's negative? Oh, wait, no, 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 it's not. No, I read you were saying. Yeah, so yeah, positive. OK, yeah, it probably <coughs> might look a little fuzzy. Um, so the minimum is negative 3.08 and occurs when x equals 1.15. That's how you write down the local minimum. Any question on the difference between what the minimum is and where it occurs? Where it occurs is the x value you plug in. What it is is the y value you get. <coughs> um, uh, any questions on how you would do the local maximum? It would be the same way. And I think it's symmetrical. I don't know if anybody checked it or not, but I think the, um, the local max is 3.08 and it occurs at negative 1.15, I think. Okay, I think it's, it's a mirror image. Okay, but always don't assume that. You would do second calc maximum and double check it. Any questions on that? So um, let's see if we can calculate a maximum here. It says we're throwing a baseball straight up on top of a 200 foot building with a speed of 64 feet per second. So I would just I would just write down the important things like initial height equals 200, initial velocity equals 64 feet per second. When does the ball reach the maximum height? What is the max height? Okay, so let's write our um, equation. <coughs> Anyone think they can tell me the projectile motion equation um, filling in what we have? Yep, Leo? Uh, negative 16 t squared plus 64 t plus 200. And when I graph that, Leo, what shape is it going to be? Be a problem. Is it going to have a, a global maximum or a global minimum? It's going to have a maximum. That's what that negative in front of the 16 does. And that maximum is what we want to know. <coughs> so negative 16x squared plus 64x plus 200. Now, I know that I'm throwing the object from a building 200 feet high. And it's going to go even higher because I'm throwing it. So I'll set my max height at 300. I don't know how long the ball is in the air for. I'm going to go up to 10 seconds. It doesn't really matter if I can see where the ball hits the ground because it's not asking me that. All I need to see is the maximum <coughs> of my parabola. And it's perfect, I can. Um, so Jane, what do I press to find the maximum? We do second cow. Yep. And then we go to maximum. Go to maximum. All right, so pick a point to the left. Pick a point over to the right. Do your guess. And 
that's the information we need. So now we just have to interpret what that means. Anyone think they can tell me what my maximum height is? Sean? Two hundred and sixty-four feet. And can you tell me when when it occurs? Two seconds. It'll occur at two seconds. So the max height two hundred sixty-four feet, and it occurs at two <coughs> seconds. Questions on that? Okay. So last thing um, I'm going to mention has to do with local mins and maxes. And it basically gives you a way to figure out when do you get a local min or max? What, what has to happen in the graph? So where is this function increasing? From, from what letter to what letter? J? B to C. It's increasing from B to C. Where is the function decreasing? <coughs> well, um, Dylan? A to B and C to D. <coughs> A to B, yep. <coughs> and C to D. Okay, that's what we mean by increasing and, and decreasing. What happens, and I'll draw another picture down here, as a function goes from Increasing, okay, I'm increasing, 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 decreasing. What happens when you go from increasing to decreasing? Yeah? It reaches like a constant. Yeah, it reaches some kind of maximum. It, in this case, it looks like a global maximum. Could be a local maximum. But the point is, you get some kind of maximum. What about? as a function goes from decreasing, okay, I'm decreasing, to then increasing. You get a minimum. You get a minimum. Could be a local minimum, could be a global minimum. You get some kind of minimum. <coughs> so you get some kind of minimum. So the last thing, I'm going to give you a problem, and you're just going to tell me where it's increasing and decreasing, um, just like we just did. Uh, it's probably, you don't have to worry about it, but basically this just describes what increasing means. It means as x goes up, y goes up. That's increasing. If as x goes up, y goes down, that's decreasing. Okay, so again, you really, um, you don't need to write that down. As long as you know what increasing and decreasing looks like. X goes up, Y goes up is increasing. <coughs> X goes up, Y goes down, that's decreasing. All right, so we're going to take the graph we had that I got rid of x cubed minus 4x. And I think this is the one we had to adjust. No, we didn't have to adjust the window. Now, normally what I would have to do to answer where this graph is increasing and decreasing is I would have to find the coordinates of all these points. But just to simplify it, We'll call that a D, and we'll call that C D. Where is this graph increasing? Remember, when you describe increasing and decreasing, only use the x values. That, that's how you describe it. So from what x value to what x value are we increasing? Leo? Negative infinity to A is positive. Right. Negative infinity up to A. We don't include A because right at A, we're not increasing or decreasing. It's like flat. 
Okay, but we're increasing from negative infinity to A. Um, and you also said from what? From C to positive infinity. Yep. From C to infinity. It would be up to you to find A and C. And then we're decreasing from what to what? Um, that's the um, that's what we are decreasing by, but we always want to describe it with the x values from a to c. Yes. If you wanted to know what are you decreasing from and to, that's b and d, from b down to d. But a to c is how you describe the interval. Intervals always use x values. So that's increasing and decreasing. Okay, so homework tonight, um, it's on two separate pages. If there's questions where you don't need to show any work because it's just a graphing calculator problem, um, that's fine. Um, but you do need a graphing calculator, I'd say, for at least half the homework, just to calculate mins and maxes and stuff like that. Okay, so just as a reminder, um, I will be after school tomorrow, okay, if anybody needs extra help. And we will have our last test before progress reports on um, Friday.